So I just wanted to go over the calendar today. We never got to 3.3 on Thursday. So we are going to pick up with that today. Um, I'm hoping we can finish it and get into 3.4. Whether you finish 3.4 or not, I don't know. We were to go. Um, 4.1 and 4.2 are both not empty sections. So I'm sure I can cover those in a day. Now, whether or not I'll have to strike 3.4 because they were both, I don't know what's going to happen. So originally I had Wednesday as a homework day. But if we're not able to cover all the material as I originally planned, then we will end up having to use that day. Okay. I'm hoping we can get through it, but we'll see. Okay. So I'm just gonna go however we go and we'll see where today takes us. Okay. Now I did go ahead and look up the stats for 3.2. And as it turns out, only two people from the face-to-face -face class have actually completed the 3.2 homework, um, meaning that they scored an 80% or higher. I have two people that attempted it, but still have a score less than 80%. I think you need like a 50, a 58 points out of the 73 points for that assignment in order for you to get the 80%. Okay, so if you don't have 53 points or more, then you're going to be in this category. Okay. And then I have seven from the class that either have started it, but haven't clicked submit yet, or just didn't, hasn't downloaded or seen it at all. Okay, so that they're in the same category. I, I have seven of those. So that means about 50% of the class is staying on task with homework so far in this face-to-face -face class. Um, the online students also watch these videos. So I just wanted to point out the online stats. They're not as good as these, although these are not perfect, right? Um, so I only have one student that's actually done the homework. No one that's tried it has a score good. And then I have 11 that haven't even looked at it, okay? So, that's an 8% success rate in the online class, which is not good. This is typically what's been happening in my online classes. So I need not only my face-to-face, -face, right? But I need my online people to stay on top of the homework as well, okay? So as we cover them, just go in there and try to knock those out in class web assignment. What I'm trying to avoid you doing is waiting until the very end, right before that test, and trying to do all the homework, right? And trying to retain all of that information all at the same time. It's better for you to see little bits of it throughout the week and then at the end of the review, and that's kind of where it ties all together in that review. Okay. So just I just want to keep, I'm gonna probably keep putting a little updates like that just on how we're doing in the homework. Okay. Um today we're gonna to be talking about polynomial division, which is regular long division, right? Um, and then we're gonna talk about a shortcut, which is called synthetic division. Okay. I do have to show you the long division because there are going to be instances where you cannot do the synthetic division. Okay. Synthetic division is for specific kind of problems. And if your problem does not meet that specification, then you have to have another method, right? And that's going to be this long division that they're talking about. So the first concept they're going to mention is the long division. So it says, suppose that you're given the graph of this function, and they went ahead and they graphed it for me, right? And it says, you notice that there is a zero or an x-intercept, right, of the function at x equals two. So here's two, right? One, two, and three. And you notice that there's an x-intercept right there at two, okay? It says x equals two is a zero or an x-intercept of f. So then according to those properties that they were giving us of polynomials, it also means that x minus that value is a factor of the function, okay? Which means I should be able to write this function here as x minus 2 times something else, okay? If this guy is a factor of this polynomial, I should be able to write that times another polynomial to get this polynomial. Okay, that's what a factor means, right? Because you multiply two things together and you get your result. However, if I wanted to figure out what this polynomial was, I would have to do a whole process of division. Now, I know you know the process of division. I hope you know the process of division for numbers, okay? So for instance, if I took 16 and I wanted to divide it into this, Right? 
what is the process of dividing that? Don't you first look at each term individually, right? So you say, does 16 go into four? No. So you either put a zero above the four or you just move over a space, right? Then you say, does 16 go into 49? Yeah, but I don't know how many times, right? So I'm gonna say 49 divided by 16, it goes in about three times with some junk left over, right? So I know that it goes in three times. What happens to this three once you figure it out? What's the rest of the process? It's three times the 16, right? And then that result goes where? Under the 49, right? And so then I subtract and I get this one, right? And then I bring down the next guy, don't I? Okay, that process I'm going to repeat, but with polynomials, okay? So it's gonna look a little bit different and I'm gonna show you how to work it out. So what I'm dividing by is this X minus two and what I'm dividing is the big polynomial the eight, right? And so what I wanna know is what do I get when I divide these two things? First thing you want to make sure is that this is in descending order and there's nothing missing. Okay. This is called your divisor. It's what you're dividing by. Okay. And then this under here is called your, not called your quotient. What's this guy called? It's called a divisor. And it's what you are dividing up, right? Like I'm taking this 4966 and dividing it up by 16, right? You're taking this polynomial and you're dividing it by x minus 2. Okay, when I'm done with this process, whatever I have up here is called the quotient, which is why they use the Q there, okay? And whatever I end up with the very bottom is called the remainder. Those pieces are going to become super, super important things. Okay, you need to know all the links. So, just like you chopped up the 4 and then the 49 and all of that at the 16, you're going to do the same thing with the polynomial, except you're only going to look at the first term of the outside and the first term of the inside. Okay? Just look at the first terms only. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some side work in another color. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that first term on the inside and I'm going to divide it by that first term of the divisor. What do you end up with? Six X squared, right? And so then that's what's going to come up here. 6x squared. And just like this 3, we have to multiply it by what's in the front, don't we, to figure out what's going to go down here. So I have to do the same thing here. The only, prop, the only difference is, is I have two terms that have to get multiplied by the 6x squared. So I actually have to distribute anything that goes up there, okay? So when I distribute that, I end up with 6x cubed right? And when I distribute this one, I end up with negative 12x squared. However, we did not add this 48, did we? We subtracted it. And so when we subtract polynomials, you actually change all the signs. So I like to use another color or a circle or a dual. <laughs> that was positive, it's going to change to negative, and this was negative, and it's going to change to positive. That's the subtracting part of the division. Okay, you have to change those signs so you can subtract. So what happens now when I have 6x cubed minus 6x cubed, these are gone now, right? And negative 19x squared plus 12x squared is actually going to give me negative 7x squared. And just like the regular division, you do need to bring the next term down. and continue the process again. So this time, I'm only taking this first term and that first term. So I'm gonna take the negative seven X squared and then this first term, which is just X. 
what do I get this time when I do that little division? Negative seven. And so that is also going to come up here. But we already know that anything that goes up here has to get distributed, right? So let's see. X times the negative 7x will give me negative 7x squared. But negative 2 times the negative 7x will actually give me positive 14x, right? But I must subtract the two terms, right? So when I go to subtract the two terms, I'm going to change both of their signs. So this minus is going to become a plus. And this plus is going to become a minus. So I'm no longer looking at those old signs. I'm looking at these new signs. So now I have negative 7x squared plus a 7x squared. Well, that just cancels them out, right? So, you're, so you just uh, like flip the signs to whatever yes. it is? Yes. Mm -hmm. Instead of subtracting, we just change all the signs, and then we take the line. Right. Mm -hmm. And then here I have positive 16x on top, but now I'm minusing 14x, right? So how many x's do I have? It's two x's. And then just like the numbers, you bring down the next guy, right? And so I'm going to repeat this process one more time. Well, yeah, one more time. So I'm going to take this first term only. Remember, we've only been taking the first terms, right? And then the first term out here. So we're going to take just that first term, 2x, and divide it by this guy's first term, the x. And what do you end up with? Just the 2. So I'm going to put a 2 here. But this is supposed to be a polynomial. I have to put a plus or minus in the middle. What sign is it going to be if this is a positive 2? It has to be a plus. So don't forget, you have to put a plus or minus in there. Okay. If it were negative, it's simple, right? The negative is there, obviously. But if this were a positive 7x, I would have to put plus 7x, just like the 2. Okay? Don't forget, you have to have pluses and minuses up here. OK, so just like all the other things that are in purple up there, we have to distribute them to the x minus 2. So we have x times positive 2, which is positive 2x, and then negative 2 times positive 2 which is negative four. But in order for me to subtract this bottom polynomial, I have to change the signs of it. So it becomes negative, and this guy becomes positive. If you don't have colors, just circle them. That's why I circle it, so that they stand out over the original, right? So then now I have two x minus two x, which will cancel out the two x's. And I also have negative four plus four. What happens with those? Those cancel out also, right? So I get no remainder, no remainder. Which makes sense because when they did this, they just said you were gonna have a quotient of only. They didn't have the remainder part there, okay? So now I can write my f of x as, um, this x minus 2 that I divided by, and then my quotient. And my quotient is that stuff in purple. So the x squared minus the 7x plus the 2. Now, the cool thing about these is you can check your answers. I'm not going to take time, right? And we're trying to switch too many sections in today. But you could distribute this x to all three, distribute the negative 2 to all three, combine all your like terms, and make sure that you end up with that regular original polynomial. Okay. But you can check your answers. So you'll know on the test like whether you got it right or wrong. Okay. I do have to see this process though when you do get the test. Okay. You cannot just like guess the answer or check the answer by multiplying, right? You have to show the division. Okay. So of course they have <laughs> the whole thing over here written out for us, but I kind of like to go through it. I don't like to just read off of this, right? Okay, 
So it says that we can put it like this now, which I did on the other page, right? Wasn't this my quotient that I had? And then they're saying, well, now that you have a quadratic, you should be able to factor that quadratic, okay? Now, the method you use to factor this quadratic is completely up to you. Whether you're using the AC method to get these two guys, or whether you're using a quadratic formula to get these two guys. Remember I showed you how to do that with the quadratic formula? We'll do it real quick. If I wanted to get these two factors from the quadratic formula, I would do x equals negative b plus or minus the b guy squared minus four times a times c, all over two times the a. And I'm only trying to factor that guy, okay? So let's see what we get. We get seven and then we get a little bit. Parentheses, negative seven squared minus four times six times two, we get one over 12. So we get seven plus or minus one over 12. Seven plus one is eight over 12, which reduces to two thirds. And seven minus one is six over 12, which reduces to one half, okay? And so remember what we talked about, how you can get these. If x equals two thirds and x equals one half, remember to get zero over here, right? So I first have to multiply both sides by the common denominator. Common denominator of that side. And I get three x equal to two. Here I get two x equal to one. If I want zero on the right, I need to minus that two over, right? And then I need to minus that one over. And don't I get the same two factors that they have, right? So you can get the factors using the quadratic formula. You just have to remember this last part, okay? It's just faster sometimes than to sit there and try to do the whole AC method. Plus the AC method means you have the right this is four terms and then you got a group, right? And it could be the jumbled all up in there. I'd rather you do all this on the side and then just tell me what the two factors are. Because all of this can be scribbled off to the side, right? Okay. Why do I want it to be all factored like this? Because we already know if it's factored all up, then this is going to give me an x-intercept, that's going to give me an x-intercept, and this is going to give me an x-intercept. And I actually already know what those x-intercepts are for the fractions. So it's just going backwards, right? So I already know these two x-intercepts and the one that they obviously take from the graph. Right? So apparently there's a tiny little hump in there. I know you can't see it because <laughs> it's really, really, really tiny. Even if I zoom in, it's really hard to see. But it, this thing does go just a tiny smidgen over the x-axis and that's what's creating those two fraction x-intercepts, okay? But now that we've done the whole long division stuff, we actually know what those x-intercepts are, with the exact values, okay? So let's zoom back out. I'm sure they're gonna have more practice. Um, if they do not give me another one to practice, then we're going to go to the end practice one first before we continue. Um, okay, what it says. It says in example one, x minus two is a factor of the polynomial, right? And we knew that because we saw that two was an x-intercept. Right? Remember those three properties. They say if x equals two is an x-intercept, then x minus two is a factor. Okay? Those are like one of the same kinds. Okay? It's exactly the same, which is why they noticed that there was an x-intercept on the graph. So then they knew that that was a factor. They knew that it was. And when they did it, didn't we get a remainder of zero when we divided it out, right? Because we knew it was a factor because of this property. Sometimes though, you might get responses that you don't know if they're a factor, okay? And so it's saying, for instance, here, if I take this polynomial and I divide it by X plus one, you end up getting this whole mess. I'm actually gonna work that out and I'm not just gonna say that. <laughs> so 
So let's go through that process so we can practice it again. Okay. So remember, first term divided by first term. So what do we get when we do x squared divided by x? We get an x. And so that x is going to come up top, right? And then what happens to the guys up top? How do we get the guy to go down here? We have to distribute. So x times x is x squared. X times one is just one x. And then if I need to subtract that, we change all the bottom guys to signs. So this becomes a negative x squared and this plus will become a negative one x. So then x squared minus x squared canceled. Right. And then 3x minus 1x will only give me 2x. And I must bring down the next term. If you have two terms out here, you have to have two terms out here. Go. Okay. So I'm going to do the same process again. The first guy inside the house divided by the first guy outside the house. So 2x divided by x. And the x is just basically wipe each other out, right? So I get two. But remember, this is supposed to be a polynomial. So what goes here, a plus or a minus? Yes, this is positive two, so it should be a plus. And then just like the x, we've got to distribute that positive two. So positive two times x is positive two x. Positive two times positive one is a positive two. But then I have to change those bottom guy signs. So that becomes negative and this one becomes negative. Two X minus two X will knock out, but I have five minus two. And that's where we're getting this three from, okay? Now you can't go any further. One is I don't have more things to bring down, right? I only have one term, but I'm supposed to divide it by two terms, right? So that's a key clue there, is if you don't have anything else to bring down, but you still have two terms here, you can't go anymore. Another way to tell is if I try to put that on the top and then the X at the bottom, is that gonna reduce? It's not. And so you know that you cannot go any further. So you're done. This is that remainder guy that we were talking about, okay? You cannot go any further. A quick way to do it too is if whatever x powers are here are smaller than these powers there, then you can't go anywhere. Right? And this one doesn't have an x, but that one does, right? So we can't go anywhere. Okay. But I do end up with the same stuff. What does that mean then? That means that this guy right here is not a factor of this. Okay. I mean, I could probably rewrite this some way, but it's not going to be just x plus one times my quotient. It's actually gonna be x plus one times the quotient, but then plus the remainder, okay? And this is what's called the division algorithm. When you have the quotient plus the remainder, okay? Now there's two ways to write it though. There's this way to write it. You take the dividend, what you were dividing, what goes under the house, right? what we had under the house over what you were dividing by, which was the X plus one. What will that be? What will that come out to? It will come out to the quotient plus the remainder over the divider. So be careful because if they just give you a fraction like this and ask you to perform long division, you have to write your answer in this form, okay? If they give you a fraction, okay? However, if all they're doing is telling you to rewrite a function, that's different. The division algorithm looks different when they tell you to rewrite your function. And this is what it looks like. So when you're rewriting your function, it's going to be the divisor, whatever you were dividing by, times the quotient plus the remainder. I call that around the world because this is the divisor, right? The quotient is up here and the remainder is way down here, isn't it? And so you're literally going in this direction. 
going around the world. Okay. So it's going to be your division, divisor, times the quotient, and then plus your remainder. So to check your answers for those, you would actually have to FOIL this out, but then at the end, make sure you add that remainder. Okay. So for that one problem they just gave us, x cubed the other page. Oh, that's squared. X squared plus 3x plus 5. And we divided it by what? X plus 1? And when we did that, the quotient we got was X plus 2, but our remainder that we found was 3. And so how can I check that to see if it's right? You just foil this out. And then don't forget to add that remainder. So I do end up with 3x and then 5, don't I? Okay, so that's the way you can just check real quick to see if you got it right. So I can rewrite it with, you know, with your, this guy here with your remainder. It's possible to rewrite it. However, um, Unless you get a remainder of zero, that guy that you were dividing by is not a quote unquote factor. Okay, it doesn't meet the definition. I cannot take this and say, oh, negative one is going to be my um, x intercept and negative two is going to be my x intercept. Because this is not just a bunch of things multiplied together, is it? It's two things multiplied together, but then you have a plus over here. Okay. The only way I can take out my x intercepts is if I had just the bubbles, and that's it. Just the parentheses. They have to all be factors. Your function has to look like this in order for you to tell me all the x intercepts. It cannot have plus or minus something off to the side. Okay, so that's going to be a big misconception that's going to happen later. Is that someone's going to factor it? They're going to say, oh, those are my two x intercepts. No, they are not because you have a plus three right here. Okay. This problem was literally just made to see you do long division, not because of that x intercepts. Okay. So this division algorithm if you have the fraction there, you write quotient plus remainder over divisor. This guy is considered improper. How is it improper? When the degree of the F function is greater than or equal to the degree of the divisor. Okay. When we did our function, we had like X to the something. We had this, right? We had that as our function and we had this as our divisor. Isn't this exponent greater than that X exponent? Okay. So the degree of him was bigger than the degree of this guy. And that's all that that's saying, is that if this function's degree is bigger than this guy's degree, it's called improper. Now, once we were done dividing, your remainder will have a smaller power than the divisor, because that's how we know to stop, right? Is when our power on the inside is smaller than the power on the outside. Right here, we stop when this power, these x's, were smaller than those x's, right? Here we only have one x and here we have none. So right, isn't the number of x that we have here smaller than the number of x that we've got there? That's how you know to stop. So you know that you're gonna have a proper fraction tip. Okay. So what are the steps? Write your dividend and your divisor in descending order, okay? Insert placeholders with zero coefficients for missing powers of any variable, okay? We got lucky because we had six X cubed minus 19 X squared plus 16 X plus four. Didn't I have every single term I needed, right? I wasn't missing any term. But if for some reason they tell me to take six X cubed plus X squared minus five, am I missing anybody in there? I'm missing the regular X, aren't I? And so I would have to write that inside the house like this, a zero coefficient for the X, okay? 
That's what this rule is telling you. And the reason why you want to do that is so that everything stays lined up perfectly. Okay. Otherwise, if you don't, it comes out a little wonky and you'll get wrong answers. Okay. Now, there is another method for this because this can be a long, tedious process. Okay. There is a shorter method and it's called synthetic division. However, in synthetic division, you can only use it when your divisors look like this. And it can be a plus, either a minus or a plus. But what it can't have is more than two terms. And what it can't have is any powers on x. Okay? As long as you have no powers on x and you're just adding or subtracting a number, you can follow the uh, synthetic division. Now, this is so hard to explain and they're trying to do it here but this is the way the process goes the first number will always come down okay and everything that's in this synthetic division will only ever be numbers there should never be any variables in your synthetic division at all no x's okay so if you start trying to put x's into your synthetic division you know you're wrong already okay it should only have numbers so it's hard to understand when this is all the variables, but this guy is a number, right? This guy is a number, this guy is a number, this guy is a number, and that guy, right? Whatever you have here, if you have minus a number, you're going to use the opposite sign there. If I have plus a number, then guess what? I use negative k on the outside, okay? Always use the opposite from that particular factor. Then you're only going to put the coefficients of these terms in the order that they're in. So notice that the q goes first, the x squared coefficient next, the x coefficient third, and then the constant last. Okay, coefficients have to go in that proper order. Then what you do is you bring down the first um, coefficient. You do nothing to it. You literally just bring it down. Then what you do is you take this guy and you multiply it by that guy, and the result holds here. And then you just combine whatever those two numbers are to get this result. That result gets multiplied by this number. The result goes here. You combine these guys to get this number. And then this number times that guy goes here. Combine these two together, and you'll get your remainder at the end. Okay. So again, it's a long process to try to explain, but it, it helps a lot better if you just do it. So this is what I was mentioning to you, right? If it has a plus, you can still do the synthetic division. You just have to take the negative k on the outside. Okay. So here's a problem that they're giving us. Use synthetic division to take this polynomial and divide it by x plus 3. I'm going to do this problem just to show you the process. But then I'm actually going to do that problem that we did at the very beginning with long division just to prove to you that we get the same answer. Okay. So for here, notice that it says plus three on my divisor, right? This is what I'm dividing by, right? This is what I'm dividing by. I'm going to take the opposite sign of this plus three and put it on the outside, okay? And then this guy, I'm missing a term here, aren't I? I have x to the fourth. Do I have any x cubed though? So I have to put in a zero coefficient for x cubed. I do have x squared. I do have regular x's. And I do have a constant of 4. So when we go to write all of our coefficients, we're going to write the invisible 1 coefficient for the x to the 4th, then the 0 coefficient for the x cubed, then the negative 10 coefficient for the x squared, then the negative 2 coefficient for x, and then finally the positive 4 for our constant. Okay? They just all go in there. No variables in there at all. Okay? Then we go through the process. First number has to come down. You don't have a choice. And you do nothing to it. It just comes straight down. Then we take negative 3 times 1, and we replace that result in here. Then what is zero and negative three? Zero minus three, which is negative three, right? 
Now that negative three gets multiplied by this negative three, giving me a positive nine. So what is negative 10 plus nine? Negative one. And then negative three times this negative one is gonna give me positive three. So now I have negative two plus three, which is positive one. And then negative three times one is negative three. And four minus three is a positive one. I'm pretty sure in the next case they're gonna do that. They did, and they have the same exact numbers I have, don't they? They have negative three on the inside, positive nine, positive three, and negative three. And down here at the bottom, they have one, negative three, negative one, positive one, positive one, right? The last guy is always going to be your remainder, okay? These guys, you have to put the x's back in. They are just coefficients, right? So remember, the last guy is going to be your constant. The next guy is going to be your x. The next guy is going to be your x squared. And it's just going to keep getting higher in exponent as you go further to the left, OK? But always start with the constant first on the right, and then work your way this way. So that's where they get this number from, right? 1x cubed, and they just have x cubed. Then minus three x squared, that's the term they have there. And then minus x is the term they have here. And then the plus one constant is what they have there, okay? That's where it came from. And so here they're just writing it. They took, they took the fraction and they're writing it as the quotient and then the remainder over the divisor. Now I do want to go back to the other problem we had when we divided by x minus two. Just so that we can see it and make sure that we get the same thing. So we divided this. Is there anybody missing in this polynomial? No, right? So I'm gonna take this polynomial that we had before. And we're going to divide it by x minus 2 like we did before. Okay, but we're not going to do longer than this time. We're going to do synthetic division. Since nobody's missing, I'm just going to put the coefficients in. Just like they are in that same order. But what number needs to go on the outside? Right, go the opposite of that, right? So this is negative. I'm going to put a positive two up there. And then we go through that process. Bring the first one down and then multiply. Put the results here. I combine these. I get negative seven. I multiply. I combine these. I get positive two. I multiply. I combine these and I get zero. The last one is my remainder, right? This is my constant, this is my x, and this is my x squared. So I get 6x squared minus 7x, positive 2 as my quotient. Isn't that what we had as our quotient over here? Is that the exact same thing I have in purple? And then my remainder is the exact same thing too, right? Zero. So it's just a faster way of doing that long division. Now be careful because you will be asked a problem on your review and most likely your test for long division. Because later in calculus, there are stuff that you have to divide by that's not just x minus a number or x plus a number. Okay. So that way later when you see it again, you have at least seen the whole process of the long division. Okay. Okay.
But typically, in this class, we like to use a third division because faster, right? It's a little bit easier to go through motions on the third division. Okay. Now, I kind of mentioned this theorem already, but not quite. I don't think it's this one. I think it's the factor theorem. So the remainder theorem is a really interesting thing. Okay. What they tell you is that if you have a polynomial and you were to divide it by a factor that looks like this, whether it be plus a number or by a factor, the remainder will always turn out to be the value plugged in. So if I plug in that k value, the opposite sign into the function, I actually get the remainder. Let's test that, okay? So what number did we put out here? We put a positive two out there, right? If my function was this thing, and it was, they're telling me that I would have gotten the same remainder just by plugging in that two. So let's see if that's what we actually get. The square, this should be cute, right? Okay, so six parentheses two zero minus nineteen two squared plus sixteen times two minus four, and I get zero, which is the exact thing as we got for the remainder, right? So it's just an interesting thing. It will come in handy, I promise. <laughs> I, I know what's coming, so this, it seems like such a silly you know, thing to recognize. You're like, oh wait, that's not kind of cool. You know, that's always gonna give me the right, right remainder. But I promise you later, you're gonna have to, you're basically gonna have to guess what number is here. And then it only works if you get a remainder of zero. And so you really don't wanna sit there and do the whole synthetic division for every single guess, just to see if you get a remainder of zero. So this clue comes in real handy because all I have to do is plug in my guesses into the function. And if I get zero, then I know the remainder is zero. I don't have to go through that whole process. Okay. So it will come in handy to your for like a lot. It's so nice. But it also makes me probably feel wrong. Sorry. <laughs> I just thought, okay. Um now, what is this saying? It's saying use the remainder theorem to evaluate this. So this is actually way, one of the problems in your homework are gonna be awarded. And I think on the department's final exam, they have the same thing, okay? You have to be careful because it's super important that you follow instructions, right? On this last test, I got a bunch of people that got problems one and two and nine and 10, like way wrong because it didn't follow the directions where I said, label your key numbers, label your test values, show the testing uh, steps, all of that good stuff, right? All those directions. So if you don't use the remainder theorem to figure out what they asked you to figure out, you're not gonna get the points for that problem, okay? So when they're telling us to do that, we have to actually show both parts. We have to show that if you did the synthetic division and you got this value, is it the same thing as if you had just plugged in negative two? Okay, you have to do both. And so they show, yeah, it does come out. If Plug in negative two, I do get negative nine, don't I? And if I do synthetic division, I do get negative nine. So when you see the problem like this in the homework, you're gonna want to just plug in negative two to get the answer real fast. But if this problem's on the test, you have to do both. You have to plug in the negative two to get the remainder, and you have to do the synthetic division to show that it's the same remainder. So just be very, very, very careful with this particular problem. Now I'll walk you through it. Is there anybody missing in this guy, in this function here? Oh, sorry, thank you. All right. So I've got, well, one, it's in descending order. It is in descending order. And then two, is everybody present or am I missing any X's? I've got Q squared, one and none, right? So they're all there. And so then they're asking me to test this value. Now notice that it's not this, 
or this, right? These are what they look like when they're factors. When they're just x equals a number, this is the k value that you're supposed to put on the outside. So I'm glad they brought this up because people will put the wrong signs, okay? If it's plus or minus with the x, you need to change the sign. But if it's x equals this, then you use that number exactly as it is, okay? So you have to do both. You have to think about it, whether it says x equals that number or whether it says x plus that number, okay? You have to know which sign to take. And so I follow the process. Bring the three down, multiply it by negative two, I get negative six, combine these, we get positive two, multiply these guys, get negative four, combine these, you get positive one, multiply these guys again, you get negative two, combine those guys and you get the negative nine, right? So the whole process. So that's showing, yeah, that's my remainder, right? Now let's go prove to them that we get the same thing if we just plugged in this number. And so they did all the work for me, I'm not gonna do it, but they plugged in the negative two, so three, negative two cubed, plus eight, negative two squared, plus five times negative two, and then the minus seven. And they did all the computations for us and they ended up with the same thing, right? Negative nine. And so they do match, okay? Now here's a factor here. This is the one that's important, okay? It says, if I have a polynomial function and this guy is a factor, it will only be a factor if and only if that remainder thing is a zero. Right, when I plug in the K value, isn't that the remainder? So it's basically saying this guy is called a factor if after I divide it, I get a remainder of zero, okay? That's the only way that I can say that that's going to be a factor, okay? And remember your goal for these functions are gonna be to factor it, right? Your goal for all these functions is to factor them completely. So you can pick out all of those x-intercepts, look at the multiplicities, know if they're gonna touch or cross through, right? That same stuff that we did in the last class, okay? But we have to have a way to factor this because if I give you x to the fifth plus three x cubed minus plus x minus five, something like that, you can't factor that by grouping, okay? I'm not gonna match. So I have to have some way to factor this. And that's the whole point of all of this math is so that I can figure out a way to factor this, okay? And your goal is to get that into the five little factors, okay? And I know it's gonna be five, there. Now, some of them might be squared, and then that's, you know, four with one of them being squared, so there's only five, right? So it just depends on the polynomial. Now, let's see what this says. This says, show that x minus two and x plus three are factors of this, okay? Then find the remaining factors. This is going to be super important. So they're helping us a little bit by telling us two of them, and then they want us to figure out the other ones, okay? Eventually, you're not going to be given hints like that. You're just going to be given the function and asked to find them all, okay? But they're kind of getting us there little by little, okay? So first, let's see what happens if we just take their hints and run with it. Look at this polynomial. Is it in descending order? Four, three, two, one, none, right? And everybody's there, aren't they? So I can just take those coefficients and plug them right into the synthetic division. Notice that they're all the same coefficients in that same order, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and do this one first. So if it's X plus or minus a number, I have to take the opposite sign. So that instead of minus two, it's actually a positive two. And then we start through that process. So you bring the two down, and then two times two is this four. You combine these, which gives you positive 11. Two times 11 is 22. 
you combine those, you get positive 18. Two times 18 is the 36. You combine these, you actually end up with a positive nine. And then two times nine is 18. Negative 18 plus 18 is zero. This is your remainder, okay? And it should be because isn't it telling you that this, these guys are factors, right? And so we knew we should be getting zero. If you're not getting zero and it's telling you they are factors, you know something went wrong somewhere, okay? Now that we've taken one out, we can keep going, okay? So I have to flip over the page, but I want you to pay attention to the numbers that are here. Two, 11, 18, and nine. So notice that when they did the next factor, this factor, they just basically continued where they left off, right? The remainder is the remainder, so they don't have the remainder here, but they do have the 2, 11, 18, and 9, okay? Everybody, everybody except the remainder, okay? I like to continue it right here, and I actually do this. And I just chop it off right before that remainder goes. Okay, but I like to continue it. I don't go and write a whole other problem. Okay. Since I'm going to do x plus 3 as a factor, what do I put on the outside here? Negative 3. And then I go through that whole process again, right? Bring down the 2, multiply these guys, combine these guys, multiply those, combine these, multiply those, and then combine those. And lo and behold, I get another 0, right? because it is a factor. So I already know it's a factor. What is this? This is a constant, this is an x, and this is an x squared, isn't it? So I can write my function, this function right here, as the first factor, x minus two, times the second factor, x plus three, times this thing that I got here. And I put plus signs for the 5x and the 3 because these are positive and positive, right? It's a polynomial, so I have to have a plus or a minus. And then it's telling me then find the remaining factors. And so I have a choice. I can either factor it using the AC method or I can factor this using the quadratic formula. But I must factor this to find the two remaining factors, okay? I'm gonna turn this over. Now they apparently factored it already and got this, okay? Um, if you cannot factor that, then do the quadratic formula. So if this is what I'm trying to factor. Notice that that's your A, that's your B, and that's your C right there, right? So I'm going to factor it. Negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4 times A times C all over 2 times A. Um, 25, that's 12, 24, so I get 1. So I get negative five plus or minus one. Negative five plus one is negative four, right? And negative four over four is negative one. Negative five minus one is negative six. And negative six over four is negative three halves. So remember, you have x equal to this, and you have x equal to this. I want them to look like factors, right? So for this one, I have to add the one over. And for this one, I have to multiply by two first. And then I have to add the three over. And don't I get the same two factors that they have here, right? So you can get those from the quadratic formula, okay? If you're not great at AC method, just do the quadratic formula, okay? But you do end up finding those other two factors. So that's it, that's all they have for information for us. But now we need to practice some of these, okay? So it's always good to just kind of go over it again, right? Just to kind of ingrain it in there. And we have quite a few of them. We have one, two, three, four, five problems to practice. So 
So let's try. So this one says use long division to divide this. This one says long division though, not the synthetic division. Okay, can I put all of this stuff, all of the dividend, can I put all of the dividend inside there just like that? Or is there anything missing or in the wrong order? It's good, right? They're all in the correct order and nobody's missing. So we're just going to put them all in here. And then my divisor for long division, you put everything just like it is. There's no like parts of it or opposite sign or any of that with long division. So how do I get the first guy that will go up the top? X to the fourth divided by X. This first guy divided by that first guy. And we get what? X cubed. So X cubed will come up here. And then what happens to that X cubed? Distribute it. So then this times this. So it'll become X to the fourth and then six X cubed. But then I've got to subtract these, right? So we're going to change that one to a negative and this one to a negative. So that will wipe out my x to the fourth, but how many x cubes will I have? Four x cubes. So we got to bring down the next term. Remember, there needs to be two terms down here. Always, because there's two terms down here. Two out here, you need two down here. Now what do I do next? It's like a whole new problem that starts all over again, right? So you take this first guy and divide it by that first guy. And so what do we end up with there? 4x squared. So that's what's going to go on the top. And I have to have something in between. Is it going to be a plus sign or a minus sign? Plus sign. So then we're going to take that positive 4x squared and distribute it. We get positive 4x cubed and positive 24x squared. So then I'm going to change my signs. This one's going to become minus and this one's going to become minus. 4x cubed minus 4x cubed and work, wipes it out. 24x squared minus 24x squared, doesn't it wipe it out? Okay, so normally I would bring down the next guy, but I have to bring down the following guy, right? You aren't supposed to have two people down here for those two people. So you have to bring them both down. And as long as you still have two people, you can still keep going, okay? So now when I get here, let's go take this first guy, negative x, Divided by this first guy, x. What do we end up with though? Negative one. And so then that one, I don't have to worry about the symbol. I know what symbol it is, right? It's minus. So then we distribute this negative one. We end up with negative x and then negative six. And then when we subtract, we actually change those to both positive. They both wipe out. I have nothing else to write. So this is just my remainder. And depending on the problem, pay attention to the way they want it in WebAssign. Because WebAssign will tell you whether they want it the quotient plus the remainder over the divisor, or if they want you to do the divisor times the quotient plus the remainder. Okay. They will tell you which form they want to answer. Okay. So for me, if I were to do it in this form, 
Mine would be the quotient, which is this purple stuff, plus my remainder over my divisor. What is zero over anything? It's just zero. And do I really have to add a zero? No, right? So this could be my final answer. If it asked me to write it like that. But if the computer asks me to write it like this, then I have to take the divisor, which is x plus six, times my quotient, and then plus my remainder. And the only thing I can do is just make the little zero disappear. Which I don't really need to add zero, right? So depending on which form they want, there'll be two different ways to write your answer. Notice that they are not the same, right? So pay attention to how WebAssign asks you to write your answer. Okay. A big clue for this one is if you see f of x equals and then a box. Okay. If you see f of x equals and then the box, it's this one. For sure. Okay. If it doesn't say f of x equals, then look at the directions and make sure you know which one they want. Okay. okay, so we did one of those long divisions. Now let's see what the next one. The next one asks you to do it using synthetic division. So let's try it. Is there anybody missing? In your dividend. And is it in the right order? Okay. So for synthetic division, though, this is the part where you have to not, you can't just put everybody exactly the way they are, right? On the inside, you can only put numbers. So you can only put the two, the positive 20, the positive 38, and the negative 20. And out here, you have to change the sign. So instead of positive seven, what am I putting out here? Negative seven. And then we go through that synthetic process. So bring down the two and then multiply. And then 20 minus 14 is 6. And then negative seven times six is negative 42. That is four, but I'm gonna double check. Yes, I get negative four. And then negative seven times negative four is 28. And those guys give me zero. I always box this guy because that is going to be my remainder. The last guy is always your remainder. And then this is actually that's my constant. That's my x, and this is my x squared. So if they ask me for the answer like this, what is that going to look like? It's going to look like 2x squared plus 6x minus 4 plus my remainder over my divisor. I was divided by x plus 7, right? I just did it synthetically. And you don't ever have to write this. You can just write two x cubed plus six x minus four. And I don't think this one's going to have a function because they never even mentioned the function of their domain. Did they ever say f of x is equal to something or another? No, right? So I'm pretty sure this is how they're going to want to answer there. Try this one. Give you a few minutes to try it by yourself. Let me pause the video. Okay. We'll prepare <laughs> before I keep going. Okay, good. So it was missing the x squared. So you actually needed to fill in a zero coefficient for the x squared, right? So then when I put my coefficients only, I put three, the zero, the six, and the eight. It may have just been a computation error when you did it. So I brought down three, we multiplied it by the negative two, so we got negative six. Combine those guys, get negative six. Multiply these two, we get positive 12. Combine these, we get, all right, 18, right? 
Then we multiply those, we get the negative 36. And then finally, when we combine those, we end up with the negative 20. All right, mostly because this one's positive and that one's negative. So they end up taking away from each other. Uh, now, we have to remember that that guy's the constant, this one's the x, and this one's the x squared. So when I have to write it like this, this is how the computer is going to tell you to write it like that. It's going to have a box. It's going to have plus a fraction bar with a box on top, and then it's going to have that divisor at the bottom. Okay. So when you see that in web design where it has one box here, a plus sign, and then this divisor at the bottom, they only want you to write in the quotient and then write in the remainder. And that's it. Okay. And so that's your clue that they want it in this form. Quotient goes here, and then your remainder goes at the top. And they already have your divisor at the bottom. Okay, let's see. So this one does tell us about the ones that are exactly like that. So it's telling us how I want the answer, okay? It says write the function in this form for the given value of k. And then also I want you to demonstrate that f of k is the same as the remainder. So here's the function they gave me. Here's the k value. In order for me to figure out this quotient stuff, I am gonna have to do the division. It never specified whether I needed to do long division or synthetic division, so I do have a choice. But for me, synthetic is easier, and so I'm usually going to default to that. Okay. Now, notice it doesn't say x plus three or x minus three, right? It literally tells me exactly what k is, doesn't it? So I am not going to change this guy's sign. I am just going to use the three exactly as it is. The only time we change it is if it says x plus or x minus. Okay. Do I need to fill in any zero coefficients into this function? They're all there, right? Three, two, one, none for my powers. So I'm just going to use a coefficient coefficient of positive one, coefficient of negative one, negative 12, and then positive 13. Bring down the first guy, multiply those, combine, multiply, combine, multiply, and combine. The last guy is my remainder. So it wants me to write my function in x minus k. So in my case, that would be x minus 3. And then my quotient. What is my quotient here? I know my remainder is negative five, so I put plus negative five. But what am I going to write for my quotient? Almost two x, and then minus six. Remember, this is your constant, your x's, and your x squared. And all of that is your quotient. Okay. Which I think they write as q of x. So, yes, that q of x is going to be 1x squared, or just x squared, a positive 2x, and then a minus 6. Right? Now you can clean this up because we don't usually like double sign, right? So you can clean it up by just putting it into a minus. But that's really all you can do. Minus. Now that's for part A. For part A, I'm done, right? This is it. F of x equals that. For part B, it wants me to demonstrate that f of k equals r. So I want to prove that f of three, that's my k, equals negative five. Okay, we want to show that that's the truth. So let's go figure out what f of three is. That would be three cubed minus three squared minus 12 times three plus 13. That'd be 27 minus 9 minus 36 plus 13. 
Okay, five is really getting into it. So five, they still give us a hint, right? But they said, use synthetic division to show that X is the solution of the third degree polynomial equation. And use the results to factor the polynomial completely. Once you already have it all completely, you should be able to find all the solutions, right? You just said each factor equal to zero, right? But it first wants us to try to factor um it says this it is a solution and we know that if this is a solution then x minus that is a factor right we know that if this is a solution this is a factor we don't write a factor that way do we don't we write them like this right if i take this and i multiply both sides by two i get 2x equal to one and then i minus the one over i get 2x minus one okay so that's really what the factor will look like for this solution. Now, let's do synthetic division. It does say use synthetic division. Am I going to put a positive one half or a negative one half? Mm -hmm. Because it's not x plus one half, is it? It's x equal. So when it equals, just use the number as it is. Am I missing any variables? in my cubic thing right here. No, so I'm just gonna put in all the coefficients. Leave myself room because apparently I'm have fractions, which sounds very not so bad. So bring down the two, and then if you need to, use your calculator. One half, oops, not one over 52. One half times two, I get one. If I combine those, I get negative 16. Negative 16 times one half is negative eight. Combine those, I get 30. Half of 30 is positive 15. And when I combine those, I get zero, right? It said it was a factor, right? Or it was a solution. So I knew I was gonna get zero. So then now I have the factor that goes with that, which is two X minus one. But then I also have this, which is 2x squared minus 16x plus 30, and no remainder, right? But still equal to zero. And now I've got to factor that part. Again, if you're great at factoring, go for it. If you're not great at factoring, just use the quadratic formula real quick. So I'm going to jump up here so I can use the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared times four times a times c all over two times a. I have no idea where that is. Uh, negative sixteen squared minus four times two times three. It's 16 inside there. And the square root of 16 is just 4. So I get 16 plus 4, which is 20. And 20 divided by 4 is 5. 16 minus 4 is 12. And 12 divided by 4 is 3. All right. Oh, I know why. This is not coming out right. Before I continue, 
actually screwed up. I did do the quadratic formula, but I promise you, look, this is wrong. I got five, so it should be x minus five, and I got three, so it should be x minus three, right? But if I were to multiply these two things out, am I going to get this? I'm only going to get x squared. I'm not going to get two x squared, am I? Why is that? Because this thing actually has GCF. Doesn't it have a GCF? A two. So I should have factored that two out. And if I factored that two out, watch what happens. I get x squared minus eight x, is that right? And then plus 15. You have to factor out that GCF first, okay? Once you factor out that GCF, yes, you do get x minus five and x minus three. Okay. So that's why it's super important for you to check, right? Always check your factoring that you did it correctly. And I noticed that when I multiplied these two, I was not going to get this. So something else was happening behind the scenes. Okay. And that's what made me look at that and say, oh, I should have taken out a two. But notice it doesn't change the answers, does it? You still get the same negative five and negative three. And if I do multiply these out, I do get what's inside the frame. So then we've done, we have factored it. They asked us to do this. They asked us to factor it all up. So we did it. And then it says, list all the real solutions. So we know that one half is one of them and it comes from this factor. What is another solution? What solution will you get from this factor? Five. And then what solution will you get from the last factor? Three. Can you get any solutions from this factor? There's no variables, right? So if you set it equal to zero, you cannot solve for x. There's no x. Okay. So these coefficients don't give you any solutions. So those are the only three solutions there. It's supposed to be a comma. Okay, how much more time? Because I think I can maybe talk a little tiny bit about 3.4, but not too, too much. It's more of this. It really is. It's all just a bunch more of that. Um, what's the definition? We might go through all the definitions until we can finally get to some problems. We definitely will not be able to finish. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about 3.4. So 3.4 is more about these zeros. Okay, and all we've been doing is finding those factors. Now remember, x equal to this number is a zero for an x-intercept, right? And then x minus that number is a factor. You've got to remember that these two statements are one and the same. Okay. Or x equals k is a solution to f of x equals zero. Same thing. All three. Same thing. Okay. So if they tell you this, you know what the factor looks like. If they tell you this, you know what the factor looks like. Does that make sense? Okay. Now in this section, we're gonna be using a couple of things. We're gonna use the fundamental theorem of algebra to determine the number of zeros a polynomial function will have. That's super easy, if whatever the highest power is, right? We kind of have already said that before in the past, but there's not just a theorem to back us up when we say that. Um, find the rational zeros of a polynomial function. This is gonna be super helpful later, but I give you no hints. That is going to be what you use. Conjugate pairs. I've already kind of mentioned that before. I told you that in order for you to have imaginary solutions, they're going to come in pairs, right? They're going to come in conjugates. So we kind of know a tiny bit about that. So how is it going to play out? We'll see. And then finding the zeros of all the facts of polynomials by factoring. We'll also use some rules to help us figure it out. And then, of course, we might eventually get to some real life problems. We'll see. 
So it says in the complex number system, it says every nth degree polynomial function has precisely n zeros. So if I have a fourth degree polynomial, I know I have exactly four zeros, okay? Four factors. If I have a third degree polynomial at the cube, then I'm gonna have three factors, okay? Just keep going in that way. Now, it says, if a polynomial of degree n, where n is of course greater than zero, then f has at least one zero in the complex number system. We already know that. We know exactly how many you're supposed to have. And then because of that, you can factor it into however many they are, okay? So for example, if I have an f of x equal to x cubed plus 5x plus 7, something like this, okay? That means if 3 is the highest power, I should have 3 factors. Now, that doesn't mean that one of them can't be squared. Isn't that still 3 factors? Right? Or that there's one that's cubed, right? Aren't all of these three situations still have three factors, right? And so that's all this linear factorization theorem is telling us that whatever the highest power is, that's how many factors you should have. They may look a little different from time to time, but there should be three of them, okay? Um, and then it says, that note that the fundamental theorem of algebra and the linear factorization theorem only tell you that zeros or factors of a polynomial exist. They do not tell us how to find them, okay? So they're just basically saying, if you have a cube, you know that you should have three factors. How the heck do I find those three factors? Well, it's a little, a little <laughs> busy that whole process, okay? So here it says a first degree polynomial, right? The exponent, the highest exponent is a one, right? This is a first degree polynomial and it has literally just one factor. And then the zero that comes out of it is x equal to positive two. Is that true? Right. If I set that equal to zero, I will get x equal to two. Now, if I have something like this, notice that when you factor this, you get x minus three which can be written as x minus three squared, right? But there are two factors there, aren't there? And I had a squared, so I knew I should have two factors. But when I set each of those equal to zero, don't I get three twice, right? That's all it's saying. It's called the repeated zero. We also know that repeated zeros, they have multiplicity, right? And those multiplicities tell us something. We've already talked about that. We will bring it together when we get to 3.5. Now, the third thing is they have a cube function, and it turns out that they factored it into this, and then it turns out they factored that into this. How the heck did they factor this into this, okay? There's a shortcut, and then the other way is the quadratic formula, okay? So if I take this into the quadratic formula, what is A? Here, what is A? One. What is B? B is 4. C is a constant, right? B is the number of x's. Do I have x's? Regular x's? No. So they're missing, right? You can write it as like this, the missing coefficient, right? Okay. So when I go to put this in my quadratic formula, I get negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4 a c all over 2 times a. I get zero and I get negative 16 over two. What's the square root of negative 16? You have to take out the i and then what's the square root of 16? Four. And then what happens if I take plus or minus four i over two? Don't I get plus or minus two i? And that's exactly what they have, don't they? We know that for the two i, it becomes x minus 2i equals 0. And for the negative 2i, it becomes x plus 2i equals 0. Right? And aren't these two my factors right there? Okay. 
So you can factor it using the quadratic formula. Okay. The shortcut is if you can factor a difference of squares, right? And then it's just x plus two and x minus two. But if it's a sum, just put odds on the end. Right? So this guy, how would you factor that? Would be x and x, and then what number and what number? If it were a minus sign, it would be six and negative six, right? So you're gonna have positive six i and negative six i, like that. Okay. When you do the i's, what happens when you have an i squared? When you boil this out, you're gonna get negative six x i. Positive six x i. You're gonna get negative thirty six i squared. What is i squared? Mm -hmm. And so then, what's negative thirty six times negative one? Is what that plus thirty six? Okay. So it's not six and six. It's positive six and negative six. But you have to tag on the i. Okay. So difference of squares x plus six, x minus six. Sum of two perfect squares, you have to put the i's. The only difference, right? Look at those, look at this one, look at this one, right? If you have a minus inside, no i's. If you have a plus here, then you have to add the i's. Okay, this is a shortcut. If you don't remember this, just do the quadratic formula. We'll get the same to answer. Okay, okay. let's see. Rational zeros test. This is what I wanted to get to. What time is it? 15 minutes. Okay, good. They've been giving us hints. They've been giving us a polynomial and then saying this is a solution or this is a factor. Okay. And then that helps me to know what to plug in to the synthetic division. Right. They're going to eventually not tell you anything. They're just going to say, here's a polynomial. Find all the factors. That's it. And so you're really at a loss because you're like, I could try anything, like an infinite number of things, right? And how am I going to know which ones are going to work and which ones aren't going to work? And I'll be here forever trying to plug an infinite number of things in, right? So this theorem actually tries to help you narrow that list down so that you know only the possibilities of the things that could work. And you're not just trying anything randomly, okay? Yes. Oh, hi. Is it me? No, I'm just checking the atmosphere. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so possible rational zeros. We're going to take the factors of the constant term over the factors of the leading coefficient and all sign variations of those combinations. Okay, so let's go with an example so you can see. So here they give us this polynomial and they tell us to use the rational zeros test and figure out what are the actual zeros. Now they're listing them here for me, but how the heck did they get those? Okay, I'm gonna get rid of that. I'm gonna say the factors of, who's my constant here? Negative six. And then who's my leading coefficient? That's the leading term, but what is his coefficient? Just the one. So what are all the factors of six? One times six, two times three, and three, I would keep going, but it's already on the list, isn't it? So that's all of them. It's one, I'm gonna put them in order, two, three, and six, right? And the factors of one, there's only one factor of one. One times one is one, right? Then you're gonna do all the combinations. So one over one is one, Two over one is two, three over one is three, and six over one is six. And then you're gonna do all your sign variations. So it could be positive one or negative one, positive two or negative two. And notice I got the exact same things that they had there before, right? I just didn't explain it where they got those from. So I have eight possible things that could work, okay? So all of these could be solutions or factors or whatever way you want to say it, okay? Zeros, right? These are all the potential zeros or x-intercepts. How do I know which ones work? The only ones that are actual zeros 
So these are possible zeros. How do I find the actual zeros? So actual zeros come from the zeros that make the remainder equal to zero, right? When we get a remainder of zero, then we know that it's an actual factor, okay? They are doing this, and I do not want to do that. This is why I told you that little theorem, the remainder theorem, is going to come in handy. I don't want to sit here and be trying synthetic division eight different times just to see if I get a zero for my remainder, right? What I prefer doing is plugging in these numbers into my function. And if you have that calculator that we're supposed to all have, this process, although it looks long and tedious, is very fast. Because I only have eight possibilities. I can take my calculator and type in this whole function, x to the fourth minus x to the third plus x squared minus 3x minus 6. Now I'm going to hit enter, but I'm going to ignore the answer I get because I never told it what to plug in for x, right? So I'm just going to ignore that. I don't know what they plug in. And now I'm going to plug in 1. So I'm going to do 1 store as x. And then I'm going to go back up to that function and copy it and then hit enter to plug in 1. I get negative 8. Is that a 0? So the negative 1, positive 1, is not going to be one of the ones that work, okay? Now I'm going to try to plug in negative one. I get zero. So does negative one work? So what are the actual zeros so far? I know negative one is one of them. Okay. Then I'm going to try two. I get zero. So now I know two is one of them as well. How many can I possibly have? There's a point when I can stop. At what point is that? How many of them do I have to get that come out as zero before I can know I can stop? How many possible, the maximum number of zeros that we get here are four. And I've already found two of them, right? So as soon as I get the other two, I can stop. If I don't get the other two, it's because these guys probably repeat, okay? So we'll figure it out from here. So let me try to get this number. It's actually not it. Nope, nope. Nope. And negative six. Oops, I'm definitely not it either. So I only got two, which means I'm pretty sure somebody's repeating or those two could be imaginary, right? Because this is rational zeros test, not irrational zeros test. I's are irrational, okay? So we have two of them. So that means that this x to the fourth, those two guys I know will work. Once I know that those two guys will work, then you can do the synthetic division, but don't do the synthetic division before then, okay? Once I know the two that will work, we are going to have to do this. So this is the one from the x to the fourth. This is the one from the minus x cubed. This is the one from the x squared, the minus 3x, and the minus 6. So we're just putting all the coefficients, right? And I did get negative 1 as an actual 0. So they're going through that whole process of synthetic division, right? And this is the remainder. We can continue from here. They like to write a whole other one. I don't do that, but they like to. But notice it's the same number, right? Then they tried the other number they got. And so they figured this out. This is my constant. This is my x's. This is my x squared. So then I have x squared, no x's, and plus 3. And that's exactly where they got this head. Okay. Notice that whatever's out here, it's the opposite in the factor, right? Whatever's out here is the opposite and the factor. Okay. Now this, I can factor it. You're not gonna like the way it factors, but it does factor. We already talked about how if it was a difference of two squares, 
you do one with the plus and one with the minus, right? And he said when there was a plus sign in the middle, you just put an I, right? The problem here is that three is not a perfect square, but that's okay. Just do the square root of three and the square root of three. When I multiply those together, won't I get the square root of three squared, which is just right? Okay. So you do have answers there. Could leave it like that, do the quadratic formula and find those two. It's up to you how to find them. But I'm going to stop here because the next section is actually going to get further into it. And I'd rather do that for tomorrow. Okay, so we're going to stop here. Try to get the 3.3 homework done. Wait on the 3.4. Don't start that one yet. Okay, we we'll can finish up the 3.4. Thank you.